Guys, it's lovely to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for your uh, welcome. Uh, Robin and I and the team uh, are really thrilled to be here. Let me read a couple of verses from the Bible to you. Can I, first of all, from the very end of John's Gospel, the last verse just about it says this, Jesus did many other things as well. And if every one of them were written down, I suppose even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And then a few verses from Luke 15. I can remember studying English literature many years ago, and the professor, who, as far as I know, had no faith of her own, she said, I believe the parable of the prodigal son is the greatest short story ever told. It's a story of two boys. And one says to his father, just give me my money now. And he goes away and he spends it on wild living. And, and about the moment the money runs out, the friends run out as well. And he ends up in a pigsty. If Jesus, as a young Jewish teacher, could have scoured his mind for an illustration that showed how far this young Jewish boy had fallen, he couldn't have picked anything better. This boy's in a pigsty. And he wanted to eat the food the pigs were eating. And then he thinks, I want to go home. I want to go home. And the father had two kinds of servants. They had slaves that were practically part of the home, part of the family. And they had day servants. You could kick them out at a day's notice. And he says, oh, even my father's day servants have enough to eat. I want to go home. And he makes up a speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the day servants. If it doesn't work out, you can just kick me out. And, and he begins the long walk home. And I imagine as he's walking, he's practicing his speech. And what he doesn't know is from the day he left, the old man has climbed onto the roof of that flat, uh, the flat roof of that house, and he's looking down the road waiting for his boy. And the Bible says this. And when the son was a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son starts to speak, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. No, 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 no. Put a rope on his back and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. My boy's home. You know, it's a joy to be with you and all kinds of people here uh, today. Uh, some of you, you feel very close to God. You almost feel you could touch him and, and others feel far away. Some are doing well at the moment and some of you are struggling. Some of you are healthy, some sick. Some older and, and some young. Some of you with kids, some of you not, some of you married, some have been the pain of divorce. All kinds of people gathered together and we've been through life experiences. We've We've known the ups and we've known some of the downs and we have come together today. Some of you are quite sure you don't believe anything. There might be a husband here, probably a husband, and you've been dragged here by your wife. If we went outside, we'd, we'd see the heel marks in the tarmac where you bravely fought the last 50 meters. <clears throat> You're very, very welcome, whatever you are. And you know, it's all very well having preachers come to town, but we all do well not to take ourselves too seriously. I was speaking in our own church some time ago on debt and finance, a pretty heavy subject. And when I finished, uh, I sat next to my wife, Diane, and I whispered in her ear, how was it? Because we're all a bit more insecure than we think. And she said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you, I was laughing too much. I said, well, what do you mean you're laughing? I've been speaking about debt and finance, people's homes being repossessed. <clears throat> she said, um, you've got odd shoes on. <clears throat> and I look down, <clears throat> and I have indeed got our shoes on. And I don't recognize this shoe on the left. <laughs> they are both black, and they've both got laces, and they've both got toe caps, but the toe cap on the left seems bigger. And I look down at this shoe, and this shoe looks up at me. And, and then I realize what must have happened. My son was a firefighter then, and he'd come around on the Saturday night, and we'd been watching Match of the Day together. We'd kicked our shoes off underneath the coffee table, and... And he'd stayed the night, and I'd rushed to get to church. I was a bit late. I'd put one of his shoes on. 
this thing had a toe cap on it that could take a jackhammer. <laughs> now, you kind of hope no one will notice. But at the end, there's a long queue of people waiting to speak to me. The leading one of which said, Oh, Rob, it must be so difficult dressing in the dark. <laughs> so listen, it's all very well being the preacher up here. But you know what? We're all trying to get through life as best we can. With our ups and our downs, we're feeling a bit of a failure sometimes. And we're just trying to get through as best we can. There's a remarkable verse that I've just read to you at the end of just gospel, John's Gospel. I write books. I think I've written almost 30 books now. Uh, a week uh, Friday, I'll be teaching a creative writing class in a high-security prison to a bunch of guys, helping them write their life stories. I like to write books. Uh, but you know the hard thing about writing books is what you leave out. You, you've written all this stuff, and, and there's a phrase that we have amongst authors, and we call it killing your darlings. It means that you, you can't put it all in. You, you sometimes have to leave that bit out. But, oh, I loved writing that, and I think it's so great. And the editor will say, no, no, we need to, to leave that out. And I know the Holy Spirit guided the apostles when they worked out what they were going to put in, the, in these Gospels. I understand that. Nevertheless, they had to sit down with his guidance and think, what do we put in and what do we leave out? Because as the verse says, if you wrote it all down, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Yeah. And there's some fascinating things. Did you know that the obituaries of all the famous people already filmed by the BBC and ITV and Sky, the, so if Keith Starmer or Boris Johnson or the Queen, the, their obituaries are already on film. And what you'll see when you watch them is quite a lot about their life and then a tiny bit of their death tagged onto the end. The life of Jesus is different. There's almost nothing about his childhood, nothing. In fact, the only bit about his childhood really is his parents lose him. That's pretty serious to lose the Son of God. I don't know if you've ever lost a kid. We, we have, it's horrible, you know. And, 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 and then you have a little bit of his teaching and then the gospel accounts slow down and the years become months, become weeks, become days, minutes, seconds almost and we're watching a man die. Over a third of the gospels given over to the events around the death of Jesus. A third of them. As if somebody's saying, this is why he came. You're going to have to leave some stuff out, but you, you need to put this in. This is why he came. And I imagine them talking and saying, well, guys, what shall we put in and what shall we leave out in? And then somebody saying, because they were fishermen, guys, we have to put in what happened around Galilee. I, I've been privileged to go to Israel quite a few times and and I remember the last time I was there, I was on the edge of Galilee. I'm looking out over that lake. You come over the brow of a hill, and there's Galilee still in a bowl of hills. The Golan Heights are on the, on the far side. And, and in the, the, before the, 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 the Six-Day War, the Syrian tanks would sit up there, and they would fire across. So the hotels along that other side have, have bomb shelters in. And, and I would look at the Lake of Galilee, and... And I can remember being there and thinking, wow, I hadn't been back for 25 years and all that's happened in there. Joys and pains and, and a friend of mine who we worked together for many years suddenly had an affair and left and, and joys and fears and triumphs. Do you know how Rick Warren put it? Rick Warren said, we tend to think of life as mountains and valleys. The mountains are the great times and the valleys are the tough times. But he said, for most of us, it's not like that. It's more like a railway track. And on this track, good things are happening. But at exactly the same time on this track, bad things are happening. And we go through our life trying to manage both of those. And for some of you at the moment, life will be pure bliss and for others it will be pure agony. But for most of us, we're balancing those twin tracks. And I look at that lake and I think, yeah, that's pretty much how it's been. And as I look at that lake, an incident comes to mind that captures my heart again. 
they said, we've got to put this story in, guys. Do you remember what happened? <clears throat> they were on the lake together, and Jesus wasn't with them. He was in the hills praying. And they're on the lake rowing. But a squall comes up, and they're not doing very well. They're not getting very far. And they're struggling against the wind. And what they don't know is Jesus is in the hills, and he's watching them. And suddenly, as they are struggling, he is walking through the rain, through the squall, across the water towards them, and he is shouting out to them, It is I, don't be afraid. When I was a little boy, my mum and dad didn't go to church. But on the corner of my street was a little gospel hall. And in that gospel hall was a Sunday school teacher called Miss Williams. She was very, very short. And one day, Miss Williams decided she was going to knock on every one of the 31 houses in our little terrace and ask every adult that opened the door the very same question. And she knocked on my door and asked my mother that question. Would any boys or girls in this house like to come to Sunday school? I was four years old. My mother said, he'd like to go. <laughs> and Miss Williams came the next week and she took me by the hand and she led me down the street into the world of Sunday school. You know, recently they asked me to speak at the 100th anniversary of that little church. <clears throat> and as I was leaving, somebody tugged my jacket. And I turned and a voice said, do you remember me? It was Miss Williams. <laughs> to be honest, I thought she was 110 when she came to get me when I was four. <laughs> I only just stopped myself saying, you're still alive. <laughs> oh, we love Miss Williams. Do you know, she never did have any kids of her own, but, but she had thousands of kids in many ways. We loved her for two reasons. We loved her because she gave us little stickers. Every time we turned up a class, she gave us a sticker. And we would swap them. We would swap the red Jesus walking on water for the, the common feeding the 5,000. If you got a doubler, you would swap the stickers and Miss Williams gave a little book to put them in. But best of all, we loved her stories. She was a brilliant raconteur. And our favorite was David and Goliath. And Miss Williams didn't hold back at the end and we loved it because we all had a bully in school we'd like to see decapitated. <laughs> <clears throat> and Miss Williams took me aside one day and she said to me, Robert, it is very, very important that you come to Jesus. And Miss Williams was right. But you know, I discovered later in life that there is something else that is important. That there will come a time in my life when I am rowing against the wind and I'm not getting anywhere. And it's hard. And what I need then is for Jesus to come to me. And there will be somebody here today and you're going through a tough time. And it's not necessarily that you need to read the Bible more or pray more or come to more meetings. What you need is for Jesus to come to you. As he came to Mary in that garden tomb and said her name, Mary, Mary. And sometimes that touch, that presence, <clears throat> is what our very soul cries out for. And he would come to you today. It is I. Don't be afraid. Guys, let's put in what happened around Galilee. And then, guys, why don't we put in what happened, all that criticism we took. Do you remember all that stuff we used to take off the, off the religious leaders? Do you remember what they used to say to us? Do you remember the big criticism? Well, what was it? It was this. Why does he sit with people like that? Prostitutes, tax gatherers. Why does he sit with people that we wouldn't even touch? Do you remember that day they came to us and, and they asked that question? Guys, do you remember we went to him and we said, well, well they're, they're saying, why do you sit with people like that? And do you remember how he answered them? He told them three stories. Let's put those stories in. Do you remember the first one? Do you, remember, do you remember he told that story about the shepherd and he was counting the sheep at night? 98, 99? 99 is pretty good on a cold winter's night in the Judean hills. 
But it wasn't enough for that shepherd. He's out looking for the sheep lost away from home. And then do you remember the second one? We, we must put that in about the woman who'd lost a coin at home. And then, guys, do you remember that story? About the boys. And one was lost away from home. And one was lost at home. Shortly after I wrote the book, Bringing Home the Prodigals, a woman wrote to me. She said, my daughter left when she was 24 years old. She turned her back on God and on us. We didn't know whether she was alive or dead. We didn't see her for four years. And she said, as I put the light out at night, I used to say to my husband, leave the porch light on. Leave the porch light on. And at Christmas, I would put a little Christmas tree outside the front door, as we used to when she was a child. And you know, Rob, it wasn't a couple of years later, she, she, she came back both to us and to God, and she said, Mom, I wanted to come home, but I was too ashamed to come home. Do you know, Mom, sometimes I would come into our street in the early hours of the morning, and every house would be dark apart from our house, and I knew that you left it on for me, that light. And I used to sit in my car in the darkness, one or two o'clock in the morning, and I'd look at that light, and some mornings I... Look at the little Christmas tree, and I knew you'd put it there for me. And I've said to parents all over the world, don't ever give up hope. Keep on praying. Always leave a light on. And sometimes as parents, we have to lay down the guilt and realize that even God has trouble with his children and commit them to him. You know, Philip Yancey talks about that parable in an incredible way. Amazing. He says there's a young girl, she's about 17 years old. And she's around with her father about the length of a skirt or the pin in her nose. And, and she walks out. She slams the door. She leaves little Traverse City and, and goes to the place she knows you'll never find it. Detroit City, big Detroit City, a long way away. Soon as she gets off the bus, there's a man waiting for her. He puts her in the penthouse of a big hotel. Men pay big money to sleep with this young girl. And for about two years, she lives like a queen, like a model. She has everything. But then the drugs get to her. And she has a hacking cough, and, and her body is shriveling up, and, and he takes her out of the penthouse, and now she's sleeping in the shop doorway. Still sleeping with a couple of men at night just to keep the drug habit going. And one night she's there, and she's got newspaper underneath her and cardboard around her, and she's got this hacking cough, and she thinks, I want to go home. And she rings her mum and dad and gets the answer phone. And she says, Mom, Dad, I, it's me. I, I want to come home. My bus gets into Traverse City at midnight. If there's nobody to meet me, don't worry, I'll understand. I'll get straight back on the bus and stay on the bus all the way to Canada. And she catches the bus. It's a long way from Detroit City to Traverse City. And as the bus makes its way, it gets dark and... And then it begins to snow. She falls off to sleep. And finally there's a hiss of brakes. And she hears the, the, the bus driver say, Traverse City folks, we're just here for, for 15 minutes. And she thinks 15 minutes to decide my life. She tries to rub some of the nicotine off her fingers. She tries to straighten her blouse. She wonders if there'll be anybody to meet her. Nothing she dreamt or imagined got her ready for the sight she saw that night. As she goes into the bus station in Traverse City, 20, 30 people, friends and relatives and a grandmother and a great-grandmother to boot. And her mother's there. And here comes her father walking towards her with tears streaming down her face. And she says, Daddy, I am so sorry. Hush, child. We don't have time for that. We're going to be late for the party. I was presenting our Bringing Home the Prodigals event just outside Colorado Springs and the pastor of a church that had grown from 300 to 10,000 by welcoming back prodigals told me a wonderful story. He said, we had a guy come to our church who was a hell's angel. He was dead to come to church. He's about 21, 23 years old. See, he had long, greasy hair. He had enough ironmongery in his face to open a small hardware shop. And forgive me, but on these knuckles, he had the letters F-U-C-K and on these Y-O-U. That was his statement to the world. And somebody dared him to come to church. 
He not only came to church, he was arrogant enough to sit right in the front row. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, that church allocates certain seats to certain people to welcome. And he got himself in Marge Staples' area. Marge is almost 90 years old. Marge doesn't have the energy these days to argue about whether we worship swinging from the chandeliers or using the old green hymn book. She doesn't much care whether the building committee built it this way round or that way round, and she certainly doesn't care whether the curtains are blue or red. Marge is going to be in front of Jesus any day now. She just wants to love people, and she says, Oh, young man! Come here, it's lovely to see you in church. Let me hug you. And as she's hugging him, he starts to cry. In fact, he cries all the way through the sermon. Gives his life to Christ that day. Five weeks later, a consultant plastic surgeon in that church gave him a skin graft to remove the tattoos. Frankly, he had to because the kid was offending people as he was worshipping. <laughs> When they baptized him, the wounds hadn't quite healed, and he had little plastic bags with rubber bands on as he went underneath the water. I want the spirit of Marge Staples. More and more, I want to be like that. Guys, we've got to put that story in. Because you know, there'll be people in years to come, and they'll want to know that story. They'll feel they've screwed up. They'll want to know that the Father is waiting. That is probably the most famous story in the world. Guys, we've got to put the, let's put that in. And then, guys, why don't we tell them about Peter? Peter, do you mind? No, stick it in. Watch this. Put up your hands if your favorite disciple is um, Andrew. Anybody for Andrew? Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. Okay. Um, how about uh, John, the disciple that Jesus loved? Mm -hmm. Thaddeus, there's normally a couple of clever clogs, but their hands up for Thaddeus. So. Um, uh, Peter, anybody favorite to say, there we go. Now why is that? Because he failed. Because he's like us. He was always failing. George Verwe said to me years ago, he said, Rob, do you realize that Peter was always getting wet? I said, what do you mean? He says he's always getting wet. So, so he's on Galilee, and Jesus is on the water, and he says, ask me to walk on the water with you. Now, all the paintings you've ever seen of that show Peter up to his neck in water. But that's only half the story. Because when he got back into the boat, it is true the others would have said, Peter, you're crazy. We're near the shore. We're dry. You're wet. I know. And I know I failed. But I did walk on the water. And if he'd never got over the gunwale of that little boat, perhaps he'd never got up on the day of Pentecost. And now it's after the resurrection, and the disciples are a bit depressed, so they go back doing what they know. They go back fishing on Galilee again. And suddenly they see a figure on the shore. And John, because as Verwa said, love can't always see further, says, it's the master. And they begin rowing for the shore. Not Peter. Peter's diving in. He's swimming for Jesus. That's Peter. But unfortunately, he's always getting into trouble. Imagine if there were school reports around at Peter's time. And imagine being Peter's mother. Now, John Stott reckoned that many of the disciples were possibly teenagers. So imagine getting a school report about Peter. Dear Mrs. Levi, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter ruined the transfiguration today with a silly comment on the mountain. Dear Mrs. Levi, I'm sorry to tell you that the master had to tell Peter to get behind him today. Dear Mrs. Levi, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter took somebody's ear off in the garden today. <laughs> Dear Mrs. Levi, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter denied the master. It just went on and on and on. Jesus puts his arm around him and says, Oh, Simon. That was his other name. Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I can see all you can become. Why don't we tell him about Peter? Because Peter, although it may be hard for you, there'll be Peters out there that feel rubbish, that feel failures, and we've got to know that it can make an incredible difference difference. You know, ladies and gentlemen, some mornings I wake far too early. It's still dark. And a voice in this ear says, hey Rob, if people really knew you, they wouldn't come and hear you speak. They wouldn't buy your books. To be honest, Rob, you're a bit of a hypocrite. 
You don't pray enough. You don't read the Bible enough. You don't do this. I get that about once every couple of months. But if I am fortunate, I hear a voice in this ear that says, I know you. I know you better than you know yourself. I'm not as impressed with the speaking events and books as you appear to be. <laughs> but I still love you. Nothing you do can make me love you more. And nothing you do can make me love you less. So well, when you speak at that church this morning to those lovely people, give it your best shot. But don't take yourself too seriously. It is me, the touch of my spirit on you and on them that counts. I am for you. What a thing that is. You know, I was speaking at Spring Harvest some years ago. Three or four thousand people in the big top. I spoke for 40 minutes. And when I finished, the guy got up, Jeff got up, uh, Lucas, and he, he told a story. And it took him a couple of minutes to tell it. And I knew the second he finished telling it, if he told it at the beginning, I'd never have spoken. That's pretty sobering for a speaker. This is the story he told that night. He said, I had a great relationship with my mum and my dad. But in his 80s, dad had a stroke left him unable to speak. He said, Dad found that hard. He loved to talk to me. And he said, one day recently, I rang my mum and said, Mum, I'm doing some business near your home. Can I come and stay the night? She said, of course you can, son. And he said, it's about 10 o'clock at night, and we're drinking cocoa, and Dad's in the chair there, and I'm talking to my mum, but my dad can't say anything. He can only smile at me. And he said, about half past 10, I go up to bed, and they've given me the old bedroom I had when I was a boy. And I'm lying there, and I can imagine... A picture of a spitfire on the left-hand wall and a rugby ball. And, and I begin to fall off to sleep. And suddenly, there's a knock at the door. And I'm a bit surprised by that, but I shall come in and... And it's my dad. And he can't say anything, but he comes and he looks down at me and he... And he sees there's a hair in my eye. And just as I used to, used to when I was a boy, he licked his fingers and pushed it back across my head. And then he tucked the bed close in around me and straightened the top sheet. Looked at me. Kissed me. Smiled. And left. And he said, I am lying there. And I am 45 years of age. And I have just been tucked into bed by my own father. And boy, didn't it feel good. And Jeff looked out of all those people and he said, that's what God wants to do for some of you. You have struggled to please him and, and you've done pretty well, but he is your father. He loves you. There is nothing to prove. You are loved. And if you are Peter, you are loved. Do you know we're complicated creatures, aren't we? When I was 19, I was in a band. But I was only in a band. It was kind of a Christian music band. And, 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 and they let me stay in it, not because I was a good guitarist. I could only play three chords, C, F, and G, seventh, I think it was. And they gave me a 12-string guitar. I couldn't tune it, let alone play it, honestly. And on the difficult chords, I would just airbrush. But because they used to have little bits of talking in the middle, they let me stay in the band because I was okay at that. And then one day, they decided they were going to London and make a record. I told my mother, she told all my neighbors, she wrote letters to her relatives. My boy's going to London to make a record. And we're in the recording studio in London, and the producer's listening, and he says, there's something wrong. And then to my horror, he begins to isolate the, in the instruments. Isolate the drums, they sound okay. Bass guitar, fine. Lead guitar, fine. Me, plinkety-plonk. <laughs> they kicked me off the record. I go home, my mother said, how did it go? So, oh, I never told her. <laughs> when I was in my late 50s, I decided it was time to learn the guitar properly. So I went to a guitar tutor, uh, who was part of our church then, to be honest with you. Um, uh, he's gone now. And um, I, uh, I said to him, I'd like to learn to play the guitar properly. He said, okay. And I told him that story about being kicked off the record. Oh, he said, we'll be fine. So, so we begin practicing. And we, I suppose we practice a couple of months. And, and then he's going to be away for a fortnight. And I'm going to be away for a fortnight. So he says, Rob, you've got four weeks now to learn this. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. 
I give this thing everything I've got. I practice. And finally the day comes and I go in and he says, well, Rob, I'm seeing you for a month. Hit me. And I give him this record. And at the end, I shake the guitar like I've seen him do on the television. <laughs> Honestly, guys, I think I expect him to say, wow. Well, I've heard Clapton, but that, that was amazing. <laughs> do you know what he said to me? He said, I can see why they kicked you off that record. He said, you haven't got any rhythm, have you? Do you know the fascinating thing? By then, I was a senior partner. I had been in a legal practice. I lectured all over the world to more blue chip companies you can shake a stick at in governments, and I never went back. Isn't that strange how, how fragile our self-esteems are? Compare that with this. In our church, we had a piano tutor, a young piano tutor, and and there was a lady in our church, Doris, and, and she was in her late 70s. She always wanted to learn to play the piano. And somebody gave her a gift of six piano lessons. They paid for it. So the little piano, young piano tutor took Doris on. The only problem was Doris had very bad arthritis in her fingers. And then somebody else paid for it to go a bit more, and she put a bit of her own money in, and she learned. And then the time comes for the concert, when this tutor uh, has all her students, and, uh, and we all come in Glenwood, and we listen to the, the recitals. And now it's Doris' turn. But our hearts are in our mouths. How's it going to go? And, and Doris, thinks, and she does pretty well, and then she freezes. And, and then she begins to play beautifully again. And we open our eyes and we can see what's happened. The young piano tutor has her young fingers over Doris's gnarled arthritic fingers and she's helping her to play. And then she takes her hands off when Doris gets hang of it and then puts them back on and we all applaud and we go crazy as if we're in the Philharmonic. What is God like? Is he like my guitar tutor? Or at the lowest, most fragile moments of my life, do I sense his arms around me, helping me play? Tell them about Peter. And tell them about all of that. Because tomorrow doesn't have to be like yesterday. Tell them what your pastor told you today. I can give you back the years the locust has eaten. In a moment, I'm going to finish, but I want to tell you an incredible story that illustrates that wonderfully. Thank you for having us with you. Come and see us on the stand if you want to. I'd love to sign a book for you. Do you know, um, Robin told you about this little book, What Every Kid Wished Their Parents Knew. What he didn't tell you was I have a testing child, Lloyd. When you, if you have two kids, you will have one compliant and one testing. He, he drove me crazy. He's got three kids of his own now. When he was 15, I was in my study and I was despairing. Uh, and I, I did a deal with God. I know you're not meant to do a deal with God, but I did a deal with God. And I said, if I can see him with a child that stamps her foot and wags her finger and shakes her head, you can take me then. And I watch him now with Evie. She stamps that foot, she shakes that finger. And I think, any day now. <laughs> Swing low, sweet chariot. You know, my kids have for their kids something called the, the thinking step. It used to be called the naughty step, but that's not politically correct. It's the thinking step. <laughs> Apparently, you, you, if you're naughty, you have a minute on the thinking step for every year of your life. I don't know what the big deal is. For me, all those minutes on the thinking step would be like a spiritual retreat. <laughs> Evie lives her life on the thinking step. She has her meals on the thinking step. They tuck you into bed at night on the thinking step. <laughs> and when Lloyd was 17, he said, Dad, I want to write a book. I said, son, you've never read a book. I said, what do you want to write a book on? He said, I want to write a book how you could be a better father. <laughs> and that's what that book was. We wrote it 25 years ago. But we've just bought this new version out with my grandkids doing reports on their parents. So we find out what a great father Lloyd is. And we got things like this in here. My father is very bad using his mobile phone all the time. Could do better. On homework, poor. Pocket money, very weak. <laughs> I put a copy of that in there. Guys, remember what I said at the beginning? 
We're all trying to get through as best we can. The experts and the non-experts, the preachers and those who listen, the young, we're all trying to get through as best we can. Guys, let's put this story in. Put that story in. Don't forget that. Tell them about Peter. Tell them the story of the prodigal son. Tell them about Galilee. And, because tomorrow doesn't have to be like yesterday. Isaac Perlman may be the greatest violinist who's ever lived. But he contracted polio when he was eight years old. And here's the deal when Pillman plays at your concert. The conductor's in place. The orchestra in place. The audience in place. And Pillman comes on stage and he takes his seat to play solo violin. Straightens his left leg and takes the caliper off. But tonight they've come to hear Pillman. Because at the end of the piece there's a violin solo. Six minutes. Very difficult. They've come to hear Pillman. 30 seconds into that violin solo, one of Pillman's four strings breaks. It sounds like a bullet ricocheting around the auditorium. The audience gasps, the conductor drops his baton, the orchestra stops playing, and then Pillman waves him to carry on. And for the next five and a half minutes, brilliantly transposing the music from four strings to three, he finishes the piece. When he finishes, there's sweat pouring off his brow, his shoulders sag, and in the auditorium for about 10 seconds, there's total silence. And then they go crazy. They're standing on the seats, the orchestra are banging their instruments, they are clapping heaven for this gift that they've received. But Perlman asks for a microphone and silence. And when they give it to him, he shouts the same thing into the darkness of the auditorium twice. All my life, it has been my mission to make music from what remains. All my life, it has been my mission to make music from what remains. Ladies and gentlemen, none of us, you nor me, young or old, can do anything about yesterday. But by God's grace, you and I in our lives and in the lives of others, as he walks with us in the power of his spirit, we can make music from what remains. God bless you.